Good evening, everybody. Hopefully it helps you either take a good nap after the lunch or wakes you up. And uh, this is a paper that was accepted in, in Design and Text te uh, Test Magazine. I'm just presenting it for ISCAS per request of one of my co-authors that is here right now. Uh, it is a work that uh, was the foundation of the uh, project that we have in Stanford called Prism. Both colors represent different applications and the uh, Triangle is computer architecture, so it's a reverse prism. Anyways, we try to come up with architectures that can represent certain applications. So this paper, uh, this paper is about dark memory and uh, the dark silicon era. So what is the concept of dark memory and what are the important factors in dark silicon era? So let me tell you a story. From a far away time and place, a prince of Persia. Okay, so, but it is not like 1400, but it is the game Prince of Persia. Um, probably in 1990s, you have some PC and played with this game. <coughs> so in 1990s, uh, you were the prince and you had to go fight the skeletons to find the princess happy ending. But since 1990s, what happened really to this game? Look at the resolution, look at the 3D depth of the game, and uh, basically now you can see the from close a six pack of the prints, and <laughs> also the skeleton has a head or no his head, and this 3D game. Well, you have a life bar, and uh, of course the resolution has increased significantly. So I have a question for you: What is the x-axis in this picture? Is it time? Is it the heterogeneity of the chips? Is it the compute power? Is it the screen resolution? Or a bunch of them, or like wireless bandwidth or wait. Of course, you can see that the screen resolution has increased, the functionality has increased, and basically the, the cell phones that you have are becoming more and more powerful. Well, you might say these are different cell phones from different companies, and it's not fair comparison. So I want to compare apples to apples for you. So let's compare apples to apples. There are, one of them is the Apple iMac, the other one is Apple iPhone. But if you look at their specs, uh, except for the height and width uh, and the weight, basically, the, the frequency was 500 megahertz. Here is one gigahertz. Uh, the, the smaller device is faster. The RAM is four, four times more. And the display resolution is around the same. The storage is the same. So from that Prince of Persia game, on that PC uh, or Mac, we came to Prince of Persia game on higher resolution, better graphics on mobile devices. So today's platforms are different platforms. And what about tomorrow? What are the tomorrow's platforms? What, what do we want to do? Or maybe today is virtual reality. So how can we do all of these crazy things uh, in the field of uh, VLSI and computer architecture. Let's take a quiz. This is somewhere in Germany. What do you think this is? I don't have more than 18 minutes, so I want the courageous volunteer to take a guess. No way. Uh, so those are the years, and uh, well, Yale Pat says if, even if you take a guess, nobody pays you big money for it. If you take a guess. So this is actually. Moore's Law, that is in a museum of computer science in Germany. You can see the, the same number of transistors and how much space they they, they get. And uh, as the years go by, they become smaller. From 1965 to 2005. So the next slide is another question for you. Who are these people? You are in the field of circuits, so you should know these people. No guess? Does anybody not know these people? The left one is all you have to think. Yeah, and the right one? Well, the left one was more, which was more small, but the right one has the magic lamp. It, sorry, it was a slope. So the right one has the magic lamp. He is the Denard. So Denard was basically Denard's scaling. If the, the transistors are becoming a smaller by factor of the dimension of the previous generation to this one. We call it then a factor alpha. What happens? Well, we have the scaling magic. 
the power consumption of the transistor in the previous generation, the shrinking gives you alpha squared more transistors with higher frequency, uh, with lower voltage and lower capacitance. All in all, you have more transistors, faster transistors, and the microarchitecture of techniques. You can have branch breakings and order, order execution, super scalar, larger caches. You can actually get higher performance while you are using the same pop. So if you bring this table, you can see that somebody has moved your cheese when you go to the smaller technologies. Uh, the voltage doesn't scale anymore, the current doesn't scale anymore, and power dissipation doesn't scale and doesn't become half as before. So the previous case, uh, where is the, is the, so the previous case which was this and everything was good with more transistors, faster transistors, now you have a problem you are consuming more power this guy is Michael Taylor he coined the phrase dark city and then he came with a, with a paper called the, the four horsemen of dark silicon I see these four horsemen look like that so let me tell you what are the four horsemen of dark silicon one of them is the shrink horseman which says just in the newer technology let's shrink the chip so we don't use that alpha square factor we are good with the same smaller chip we can deliver but the problem is that if we shrink we are not increasing the performance so limited performance and it doesn't have any return for the newer technology the second horseman is dim which means that instead of uh, the basically uh, keeping uh, keeping the frequency faster, don't increase the frequency and lower the voltage as much as you can and basically dim the silicon. So this is seen as this. If you were at 22 nanometers and uh, you at 2 gigahertz and you had 16 cores, in the next generation you have 2 million transistors. Because of the power budget, you can only have uh, half of your cores at 2.8 gigahertz, which is increased frequency. And but with the dim, you can have all of your cores at half of the frequency, dimly turned off. And then if you go to the future technologies, the frequency cannot go up and you have to dim. Or you have to have some of your silicon dark. So the, the dark region is called dark silicon. So dimming means basically having multiple cores. That is the rise of multiple. And you can see this is a famous chart by uh, Stanford people again. Uh, uh, as around 2005, the, the single thread performance didn't increase much. The frequency kept this, uh, the same frequency. The transistors are still kept up going with the Moore's law, but the number of cores increased and the power is capped. That is the multiple error. The third horseman is the OSX machine, which is going beyond CMOS. Um, but the problem is that and manufacturing and scale for beyond CMOS is long time and uh, already we have changed the, our transistors from 80s to 2018 we have come with a lot of new technologies 3D film fed new channel materials but still it is long time to manufacturing scale the fourth one which is the target of this stock is the specialization for the dark silicon basically uh, which you design efficient accelerators that are orders of magnitude more efficient so you can deliver performance within the power cap. Nine minutes, right? So heterogeneous computing is really hot these days. Uh, all of your mobile phones have uh, DSP chips, uh, video processing chips, uh, GPS uh, processing, and um, uh, these specialized cores give you very efficient gigaflops per watt of power consumed. And uh, basically what we are aiming for is uh, area and power efficiency. Well, this is the story that you hear most of the time. People come up with the chips and this is my own research actually I'm presenting. Um, uh, that you can say, with a, for example, linear processor, you can get orders of magnitude better in terms of core or chip performance if you compare it with even GPUs. If you dedicate... Uh, Design dedicated uh, logic for special computation, you can have orders of mind with efficiency. But is this story the whole story? So, 
this is a basically positive image. You're responsible for the energy you bring in this paper in the equation. So what are the energy factors that you want to compare for the dark system? Well, don't forget the memory system energy. The memory is really important. So if I have really efficient chip, but I have to go to memory all the time, half of the energy is uh, fetching the data from the memory. So even if I shrink the CPU or accelerator's energy, it's still half of the energy is in the disk or memory. So uh, based on Amdahl's law, I can just become two ISS more energy efficient. Don't forget the cache energy, which is now on chip memory. If you scale the cache accordingly, you realize actually the CPU trends have not changed that much. In this paper, we, we, we introduced the concept of data movement versus the storage. Basically, if you have a data flow graph, you have some live variables. If you want to process these nodes sequentially, you have to keep the live variables. At any time that you break the graph, you are performing some of these tasks in sequence. So you have to keep the live variables in registers, for example. So data movement and storage are do all of each other. So we can actually just treat one of them. So this is an important table. It tells you, based on the dark memory concept, what is the ratio of computation and communication. If you have a 16-bit integer and 64-bit <coughs> double precision floating point, we compare the ratio of data movement and storage, as I said, storage we already focus right now, to the just arithmetic computation. 16-word uh, register file is around 0.7 of arithmetic add. 64-word register file is 1.38. So if you just access one of the elements of the ALU from that, you are paying half of it just for accessing register file. If you go to SRAM, 44 times more expensive energy of accessing SRAM compared to doing a ALU add. And if you do to 30K word, SRAM is 61. And if you go to DRAM, it's 4,000 times. So you don't want to go off the chip. You don't want to go to expensive, even on cheap SRAMs. And even for floating point, the, the board, three orders of magnitude is still holds. Based on that, the same chart shows if you do ALUs, um, operations like multiplication, and then fetch one of your uh, values from one of these memories, what happens? Essentially, you lose a factor of 10 in energy efficiency. So locality is really important, of course, to say we knew it. But how important it is, it's shown here, basically, for for example, double, double, uh, double precision floating point unit being on chip and going to DRAM is like around 10 times. Visual. So the dark silicon view that everybody talked about was having efficient accelerators on the chip. So what is the, mo the most efficient thing? Is ALU. Its energy efficiency is really high. So you want a chip that has a lot of compute units. You want to increase chips energy efficiency and area efficiency. And uh, in all of these papers you read, you report 10 to 1,000 times better improvements. But the real view is, the real perspective is that you have to bring this data from somewhere, from a chip DRAM. So you have to pay a lot of high bandwidth DRAM if you just have execution units on the chip. If you don't have enough padding or communication and um, local storage. So your system is inefficient, although your chip is extremely efficient, your accelerator is really efficient. You can report, I have 10,000 times the uh, normal CPU core, but can you bring the data? Can you feed the beast? So the dark memory view says you need some padding, although your chip buffers make your on-chip report worse because they are just buffers and they don't do any computation. But your on-chip bandwidth drops, and your off-chip bandwidth, which is really expensive, uh, access energy drops, and your system becomes efficient. So on-chip interconnect. So like something like GPU, you can just add more and more area use on it, but then you cannot fit the piece. So you can report peak performance of this much teraflops and this much energy efficiency, but you cannot really fit the beast. So that is the dark memory view. And some messages that we want you to remember, and don't forget, is Keep DRAM and memory hierarchy dark. 
It is not only to keep the silicon, but keep the memory hierarchy. Back. And first, focus on memory hierarchy. For that, you need the right tool. And this is not a right tool. Of course, it is an axe that is reversed. So you want a, a good algorithms to minimize DRAM accesses. And you want to have high chip locality. So let's take a look at this chart. Uh, it is really important. It is basically the complexity and versus the theoretical complexity versus uh, floating point or operations per memory. Like dense linear algebra, three nested loops uh, is basically n, n cubed operations, but if you block it, you can essentially increase the floating point operations per memory access. And uh, you can even change the nature of algorithm from uh, matrix vector multiplication to FFT. Like DFT to FFT decreases the theoretical complexity, but uh, in terms of memory op operations, it's worse. And then CNNs, you can also block them to, to take them to a higher part of the chart, which is green zone, which is more operations per memory. And this is the rest of the, essentially, space that we looked at. And what is what are the most important metrics that you remember? You want um, um, uh, to optimize for cheap area and cheap power. Increasing the performance means that you are uh, going to higher Pareto design. We, we introduce energy per up and area per up enough uh, metrics to, uh, for optimization. So you just need to optimize for a millimeter squared per gigaflops and watt per gigaflops. Your design space becomes an optimization, deeming your design basically goes through this chart. And then always be careful for the operation. Define invariant operation across different platforms. For example, DFT and FFT are both doing Fourier transfer. So you have to compare Fourier transform or transforms with each other, not pure flux. So combustion neural networks are different in architecture. You have to compare the inference rate. And then dense and sparse solvers, they have a different number of computation. You want to com com compare their solvers. So that basically, we move between this design on this Pareto curve, left and right, increase the area, decrease the, the energy consumption, and then we want to optimize for design. Uh, I want to give you an example. I promise that is the last two slides. So <laughs> if you block the computation for matrix multiplication, you are decreasing the number of accesses for elements of A. If this is your, uh, and your top level memory is always accessing N cubed operations. You see N cubed, N cubed, no matter how much blocking you do. Blocking helps you decrease the number of accesses to lower level of memory hierarchy. If we have that, uh, two Pareto curves for first level of memory hierarchy and floating point multiply accumulate with different areas we get different energy efficiency. We combine them. We have to know that energy of consumption boosts significantly as size grows. Basically when you increase the size of the top level of memory hierarchy, it, it uses a lot of energy and it has n cube operation. So memory size doesn't compensate for the access savings, which means that having higher or bigger memory on the top level is not going to help you because you are going to access it in cube times. As you saw in the previous slide, it goes up again. This is the memory. It goes up because the memory became big and you access it a lot. And then if you do further blocking, you can actually decrease that. So your parallel curve is decreasing by adding more levels of memory hierarchy. So this is basically a true parallel curve for matrix matrix one. And then if you combine the floating point MAC unit with the memory Pareto curve, you get the Pareto curve of the whole design for matrix multiplication, which is based on area, metal square, and power factor. So these are the contributors. One of them is here, Shahar, and then uh, the rest are from Stanford people. And this is the joke. Thank you.